Hi, I'm Paul Brody. Welcome to my shop. It's been a while. Can you tell it's been a little while? So, I've been out of action. Mitch has been very, very patient. I have been in hospital for 61 days. I got out of hospital about a month ago. From the time I went into hospital until filming today, that is 88 days. And we have been not filming for 153 days. That's kind of a long time. You viewers have had a lot of patience. So thank you very much for that. So what we're doing today is we're going to tell a little bit of a story of how this YouTube video came to be. Because it's a bit convoluted, like some stories are. And it involves the Excelsia. So we're going to get going and I'm going to talk a little bit about Excelsior. I know we've talked about Excelsior before, but we're going to tell a little bit more of the story today. The Excelsior story. For me, it started in about 2005, and that's when I got it into my head that I wanted to build a motorcycle out of basically nothing. I had a, a black and white photo from back in the early 1900s, and I was going to build a motorcycle off this photo. Some people thought I was a little crazy, and well, there is some truth to that, but I went way out on a, on a financial limb. I had a business, I was fixing motorcycles, I was doing some bicycle stuff, and basically I was pretty busy, and I had a, a moderate income, let's say, nothing fancy, but, uh, but what I did was basically my brand of, of financial recklessness. I turned away all my regular customers. I found out that I had a fairly substantial line of credit based on my property value. And I started living off my line of credit, just spending money. I would, if I needed a tool or I needed some kind of a part for the Excelsior, I would just go out and I would spend the money. And there was a kind of a freedom there because I was doing what I wanted to do. There was no one looking over my shoulder saying, no, no, that's not a very good idea, Paul. I was just spending money and making Excelsiors. So I turned away all my customers, like I told you, and I worked on the Excelsiors six days a week, Monday to Saturday. Sunday, I went trials riding and I woke up early in the morning and I worked into the evening. So six days a week, full time. And it slowly began to take shape, and it was, it was exciting. At first, I, I made what I call a, a mock-up Excelsior. I got the shape right, and I was using AutoCAD 12, and you know how old that is. I sat, up, I sat it up on my, my workbench over there, and I sat on the window, and I just plugged away for months, weeks and months at a time. So... In 2007, I had a bike that I could sell, and I did sell it to a local collector here. And he bought it, and he later flipped it like I knew he would, and it, it ended up in Motorcycle Motorcyclopedia Museum in, in New York. So that's where the bike is now, I believe. And then a few years later, I finished Excelsior number two, it went to Yesterday's in Holland, and Geert over there, the owner of Yesterday's, I believe he still has that bike. And then a bit later, a few more years later, I finished Excelsior number three, and it went to my friend Leon in Australia. So the bikes were going around the world. And then in 2011, I sold number four to Michael, Michael Mayberry, and he lives in, in Denver, Colorado. So that's where the four went. So I've made six Excelsiors and I've sold four. So I'm not exactly, you might say I'm crazy, but I'm not that crazy because otherwise I would not have sold four Excelsiors. So the problem then was that it was 2018 and I hadn't sold an Excelsior for seven years. So I needed to come up with a plan. So I knew there was a race down in, in Florida. It's called Sons of Speed. And Billy Lane is the organizer. I think a lot of you have heard of Billy Lane. He's uh, got a bit of a, a checkered past and 
ended up spending a little bit of jail time and he's, he had his own TV show and now he promotes this race called Sons of Speed. So it's a board track race. It's held on the, on the new Smyrna Speedway, which is a half mile NASCAR racetrack. There's nothing soft there at all. It's asphalt, it's concrete blocks, it's chain link fence. So you, you do not want to fall off there. So anyway, we came up with a plan and I have a friend named Stu and he was all keen, like he was so keen and he had a truck and we rented a, a trailer to haul the bikes and to sleep in and we went 3,590 miles from here, Langley, BC, down to Florida. That was in March of 2019 because we were taking two Excelsiors. We were taking Excelsior number five to sell and I was taking Harry High Pipes. This is Harry High Pipes here. That was going to be my, my race bike and that's the bike that was going to show all the, all the people down in Florida just what an Excelsior sounded like and how it went. Didn't matter if I won or anything like that, just to get the bike out there and to let people hear what it sounded like. So that was the plan. A board tracker is not a safe motorcycle to ride. For a start, it has no brakes, no clutch, and no transmission. So how do you stop it exactly? So I knew that it was dangerous going down there, but I kept that in mind and I told myself that I would do everything to make my time out on the track as safe as possible. I got the best tires, Avon race tires. I chose the best parts for the bike, which, which I could. And so we went down there. There was myself and Stu. We were in his F-150 truck. We were cruising to Florida. We were having fun. It was it was a high. We were we were doing what we wanted to do. So so the race was on Saturday. Practice was on Friday. And so we were heading there on Wednesday. So we got there Wednesday evening and of course there was almost no nobody there. So we stayed in the parking lot that night and then at, at six o'clock in the morning we got in line at the gate on Thursday morning which was a little bit absurd in itself, but we wanted a good spot in the pits. That's what we told ourselves. So we were lined up from 6 a.m. in the morning, and then at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, they finally opened up the gates. So we went inside to get our spot. Thursday was supposed to be a really easy day because there was nothing going on. It was just we would set up the pits, we would get the bike out, we would do a little bit of, of, of prep work on the bike, we would meet other people, maybe take some photographs, that kind of a day, just really casual. And then so we're basically unloading the bike and someone walks by and he's an official from the, from the race, Sons of Speed, and he says, racetrack is now open for the afternoon for free practice. And it's like, Thursday? You're doing practice on Thursday? So what racer can ever refuse free practice? I know that I can't. So all of a sudden, the whole energy of the place, it just, well, for me anyway, in our crew, it changed. We were going out on the track now. So we got the bike all sorted out. We got it up on the stand. We got oil and gas in it. We had a film crew down there as well. So that added another bit of intrigue or, or, or complexity into the mix, mix. That was Richard and Wayne. They'd traveled all the way from the lower mainland here. So we got ready to go out. I got my leathers on. I wore all my gear and we got down to the staging area. And there was, I had a feeling, there was, there was some kind of a feeling that I had, and I, don't, I can't describe it, but I, I remember that sensation in my body, and it was unlike any other feeling that I'd ever had or, or had since. It didn't tell me that something was wrong, but I knew that something was a little, a little different. So 
Anyway, went down, switched on the oil and the gas. Someone gave me a bump and I was off. And I'm going around the inner part of the track. That's, that's the low part of the banking. It's a, a 23 degree banking at the end. So I'm right down in the bottom. And that's the slowest part of the track. So I went around turn one and two and I'm not going that fast. I'm down in the bottom. And then I come around onto the back straight and I open it up a little bit and the bike goes a little faster. So I'm feeling a little bit more confidence, but remember this is my first time on the bike, my first time on the track. So this is all brand new to me. So I come around the corner. This is turn three and four now. And I'm on the front straight and I open up, up the throttle a bit and the bike jumps. It, it wants to go. So I'm not at full throttle, but I'm maybe at two thirds throttle, maybe three quarters throttle. And I go down the straight and then at the end of the straight, I close the throttle, but the throttle doesn't close. Something is jammed and that never happened. We had the bike on the dyno for a, a whole day and the throttle never, ever jammed. So I'm at the end of the straight and I'm looking at I got a decision to make here. Either I fall off the bike at about, I don't know how fast I was going, maybe 70 miles an hour, maybe 65 miles an hour, I don't know. It's either that or I hit a, hit a, a concrete wall. So, so that's my decision and I have to make a decision really quickly. So I decide to fall off the bike. So I just kind of, let go and the bike kind of went like that and this white screen came down in front of my eyes and then I don't remember. When I woke up I was sliding down the track on my back feet first and I looked over and my bike was passing me maybe five or ten miles an hour faster and then I, I don't remember. And then when I woke up, I had people standing over top of me and they're asking the same questions they always ask, ask. What's your name? What's the date? Who's the president? And that's when I realized that, yeah, I'm, I'm probably hurt. So then I could hear this voice and it said, Mr. Brody, we've checked your blood pressure and it's pretty low. We'd highly recommend that you take a helicopter to hospital. And I remember myself saying, well, I'm not sure if I have helicopter insurance. I think a regular ambulance would be just fine. And then it was all, all kind of quiet. There was no noise on the track. And then a little while later, it's hard to know how much time later, there's that same voice and it says, Mr. Brody, we've checked your blood pressure again and your blood pressure is still low. Actually, actually the helicopter is, is almost here. It's a really nice helicopter. It's a Bell Ranger. We think you're going to like it a lot. And that's when I realized that I didn't have a choice here. I was going to hospital in a helicopter, whether I liked it or not. So I got loaded up and I could, I could look down and they were cutting my leathers off. And I could see, I could see a, a lump right here. And actually that was my femur that was sticking through my leathers here. Not very nice, but so that's kind of what I, I remember about that. And I got flown, flown to hospital and uh, I was in that hospital for nine days. And then they transferred me up here and I was in this other hospital up in Canada for another nine days. So. That was 18 days and then it took me seven months to learn how to walk. So, but anyway, that's a part of the next part of this story. That was my rehabilitation and building myself a mountain bike so that I could get some exercise in this leg here. And that's when Mitch fits into the picture. So we will get to that part of the story. I taught frame building 101 for nine and a half years. This was out at the University of the Fraser Valley. And 
over the course of those nine and a half years, I taught 65 courses and I had approximately 165 students. In the fall of 2019, I was teaching class number 63. And someone enrolled in that class was a gentleman called Mitchell Nurse. And he was building himself a hardtail because he didn't have a, a bicycle, a mountain bike at that point anyway. And so I was also building a hardtail because I was, re, I was gonna rehabilitate my, my broken leg. We were both building hardtails and we also figured out that we didn't live too far from each other, so maybe we could be riding buddies. That's what we talked about. Eventually, our bikes were both done and so we decided that we were gonna go for a ride on Friday. So we set it up Friday morning. And now on Thursday, I had a call from a good friend of mine, Eve, Eve Gauthier, and he wanted to know what I was doing tomorrow. And I told him that, well, I'm going for a ride with this uh, a student, Mitch. And for some reason, he basically insisted on coming on the ride. So I said, well, I got to run this by Mitch, you know, because it was supposed to be just the two of us. So he said, okay. So I I talked to Mitch and I said that, you know, there's this guy called Eve and he really wants to come on the ride. And Mitch said, well, the more the merrier. So it was the three of us. So we started out what would become basically a weekly, a weekly so sojourn off into the woods. So I had some experience riding mountain bikes. I had raced, but Mitch and Eve did not really have much experience, but we were keen. So rain, shine, snow, we went out every Friday. So that became basically a habit every Friday. It was the three of us piling into my van every Friday. M myself, Mitch, and Eve. We became known as the Three Amigos. That was kind of like a little, a little nickname that we gave our group. So that was kind of cool. I was still teaching Frame Building 101. In the fall of 2019, I had a meeting with, with my new boss. His name is John. I never liked him much at all. So anyway, he decided that he was going to change things around. Our course tuition had been for a while $3,000. That was for a two-week course, Monday to Friday, 8 till 4. That's how long you got to build a frame. It was two weeks. So he decided that he was going to raise the price. He decided that he was going to raise it from $3,000 up to $5,000. I said, are you sure? That's a lot. Like, that's a 166% increase. He said, well, you're Paul Brody, as if that explained everything. And I said, well, you know, they got airfare, because often a, a student flies in, they got airfare, they got hotel, they got rental car, they got food, they got miscellaneous expenses. I said, do you really think they're going to pay five grand on top of all that? And he said, let's find out. So I said that I, I would be watching, I would be watching the registration. So as the weeks went by and the months went by heading into the next course on March 16th of, of 2020, nobody had signed up. And then finally it was, it was that date, March 16th of 2020, nobody signed up. And so the class got canceled. And also that's when COVID hit. So it was kind of like a, a double whammy. And me teaching Frame Building 101, that was a huge part of my life. So I really felt like I had lost something there. And I thought, well, what can replace that? And Mitch, he suggested that uh, we do a YouTube uh, a series of videos. So that was kind of how it started. On our rides, Mitch was the youngest. He was the fastest. So he was always ahead. So what would happen is I'd be coming down the trail and I'd see Mitch. He had his iPhone out. He had an iPhone 11 and he'd be filming me and then he'd film Eve. 
So Mitch became our unofficial videographer on these on these rides. And then I was also asked to do a, a, a clip of the 69, er sort of a, a motion travel of how the linkage works. So I asked Mitch if he would help out with that, and he said, sure. So he, we set up in the shop, right in behind where the camera is now, and he did an, an, an excellent job. So I knew that Mitch had some talent. So that was kind of the basis for when he said, let's do a YouTube video. I said, sure, let's try that. When we first started talking about YouTube, Mitch and I, and I also, I also talked with other friends of mine, I actually said, who's going to want to watch a 65-year-old guy make stuff in his shop? I was skeptical because... I knew, I knew very little about YouTube, and I really thought that this was really kind of like a long shot. It was like an experiment, because I'd never done anything like this before in my life, where I'm offering out, out knowledge and my experience out to, the, out to YouTube and the world, and I have no idea what the universe is going to throw back my way. No idea whatsoever. If, if you don't know about YouTube, how YouTube works, when you go on there and you set up a channel, before you can monetize, you know, there's a button you hit that says monetize. You need a thousand subscribers and you need 4,000 watch hours. So that takes a little while to build that up. That took us basically seven months until we started getting very small, small checks from YouTube. So if you're thinking about doing YouTube, there's quite a time before something actually happens where they give you back something. When we started making videos, we were, we were pretty green. Mitch had an iPhone 11. That's basically what we, what we shot all the early videos with. We didn't have an external microphone or, or anything like, like that. And myself, I was, I was pretty nervous about being on, on, on video. I'd never actually, actually volunteered for that kind of thing in my previous life. So it was all, it was all new to us, so, but that was fine. We made videos from April, of 2020 until May of, of 2022 and that's basically when I got sick. I had back pain. I went to doctors. I went to hospitals. They couldn't really figure out what was wrong with me until I had a CAT scan and then I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma which is bone cancer. So that really stopped our, our, our filming for quite some time actually actually months. So. I want to thank all of those of you who have offered support, who have written in, hoping I'm going to get well real soon. It's not a, it's not a fast process. It probably takes about half a year, so you have to keep that in mind. And uh, I'm going to chemo now every Monday. Monday is my chemo day, and that's going to go on until next February, I believe. So. Thanks for all your support. We appreciate it very much. And uh, Mitch and I like coffees. If you buy us coffees, that helps our channel, keeps us motivated, keeps us filming. Thank you. See you next time. Take care.